Thanks for tuning in to the Women's Vibrancy Code, a podcast dedicated to helping women move from exhausted to energized, balance their hormones, and feeling turned on by their life, their lover, and themselves. I'm your host, Mariah Brown. I'm a Yale and functional medicine trained women's health expert, midwife, mom, keynote speaker, and self-made entrepreneur. I'm the founder of my signature program, the Women's Vibrancy Code. So sit back relax, and let's chat about your energy, hormones, libido, and embracing your feminine power. Oh, and you might want to have pen and paper to take some notes on some of these episodes. So for those of you listening to this podcast, Dr. Alexandra Stockwell and I just allowed technology challenges to feel juicy <laughs> and what did what did we decide we decided that it's really nice to have good quality sound that's right our our meandering our involuntary meandering is well compensated by the deliciousness of your voice yes yeah, so for those of you listening to the deliciousness of our voice we are going to talk today about why being selfish is good for you, good for your relationship. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Alexandra Stockwell, and it's fun. You know, gosh, we've been getting to know one another for about a year now, a little bit less than a year. She's interviewed me and my husband, Michael, and her podcast. She's also been a guest in the Women's Vibrancy Code, which is my signature program. And let me tell you a little bit about her and then let's get right in. So Dr. Alexander Stockwell is known as the intimacy doctor. Uh, she is an intimate marriage expert who specializes in coaching couples to build beautiful, long lasting, passionate relationships. She's the best selling author of Un Uncompromising Intimacy, host of the Intimate Marriage Podcast and creator of the Aligned and Hot Marriage Program. For over 20 years, she has shown men and women how to bring pleasure and purpose into all aspects of life, from the daily grind of running a household to intimate communication and ecstatic experiences in the bedroom. I imagine also outside of the bedroom. Well, yes. <laughs> She's a wife of 26 years and a mother of four. Dr. Alexandra believes the key to passion, fulfillment, and intimacy and success isn't compromise it's being unwilling to compromise because when both people feel free to be themselves the relationship becomes juicy nourishing and deeply satisfying dr alexandra has been featured in the huffington post rolling stones usa today cosmopolitan business insider thrive global Mind Body Green, fox news new york city and disruptors magazine recently named her one of quote, 30 inspiring women to watch in 2022. Holy macaroni. Welcome, welcome. I am so glad to be here. And you're right. It's been really amazing. I think I recommend it as a way to get to know someone because we had our initial conversation, which really was more like, you know, what is your name? Where do you live? That sort of thing. And since then, we've been diving into these juicy, vulnerable, content rich conversations. And what a delightful and efficient way to become friends. Absolutely. And even off camera, there was a little side note of a threesome and before I started recording. And of course, we were laughing because it just, we couldn't figure out technology and my husband ended on to help and, and you know, it was just three of us on zoom. <laughs> And it was so, such a perfect little moment of laughter based on your content, which we're not actually going to talk about that today. <laughs> we're talking about compromising. So I'm curious if we can just dig right in. Um, you know, you've been working with couples for now 26 years. Yes. Wife of 26 years, 20 years in your, yeah. in your and, area and, of work. And let me just say that I've been coaching for 10 and a half years. Mm -hmm. And before that, it was in other contexts. Yeah, and working as a physician. Yeah, exactly. And a mom. And so when you 
think about 10 plus years of coaching and workings with couples and intimacy and marriage, what do you think is the most common concern that you see and hear from couples that you work with? In other words, how they think about it? Sure. Yeah. Okay. It's actually so interesting for couples who are committed, who love one another. They're not in a high conflict time. They're not on the verge of divorce. Of course, those couples exist, but the ones that I'm working with are in good, solid marriages. And very often things look good on the outside. There may even be individuals or couples who look up to them, but on the inside, it doesn't actually feel as good as it looks on the outside. And one of the things about this, which I've come to understand is that if you're in this kind of a marriage where you feel like you're settling, you feel like you're tolerating, you know, there's so much more potential, but really don't know how to access that potential or even really where to look to get support in that. It's very often that I'm working with couples who've never worked with a therapist or a coach before and wouldn't have even really thought of it until they heard me speak or read my book and then learned what was possible. I think that's likely true with women in your program, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and the other thing that I'm hearing you say is it's maybe they know deep down inside that they're unfulfilled, but there is a fear to let others see or know. Like it goes back to this fear of vulnerability and many people doing it alone. And yes, that the women that that work with me they're exhausted but they're they assume that's how it is that's how it is when you're a responsible woman right or they're unfulfilled in in their marriage but somehow out in the world they're not willing to show that and so what i'm hearing is they come to you and and sound and sounds like it's couples that are unfulfilled they want to dig in and create more intimacy and juiciness, not necessarily leave, but also they likely feel very alone because they don't, because no one is showing it out in the public. And so then everyone does it alone and they feel like they're the only ones. Yes. And what you say is so spot on, including that each of the people in the couple also feel alone in the marriage or in the committed relationship because we don't really have language to talk about what that's like when you're otherwise a very competent person who fulfills responsibilities and is likely a good problem solver. And when you have issues in the professional realm, you know what your resources are, you know that more is possible. That's true with parenting, that's true with choosing where to live, but there's something about marriage that makes it very hard to find support without having to identify as really having a troubled situation. So in that context, it turns out in my anecdotal experience that it's actually easier to say, we want to work on our sex. We want to be able to improve the sexual intimacy. And it's a whole other layer, deeper vulnerability to say about, since your audience is mostly women, I'll just speak in that way in a heteronormative context, although it applies in all other orientations as well. But it's actually easier for a woman to say, I'm not happy sexually. It's hard to say it, but it's easier to say that than to say about the man that she's built a life with, probably has a family, is intending to spend the rest of her life with. And then to say, we really need more emotional intimacy. The level of vulnerability with that is extreme. And at the point at which you're married, you've been married for five years, 15 years, 25 years, most people and the people in society expect that they know how to do marriage. In fact, <laughs> I'm reminded my husband and I worked with actually a very wonderful therapist when we'd been married for, I think, three years. And with my, when my husband and I got married, we 
always planned to go to therapy. I certainly did. I don't remember whether I discussed it with him, but I planned to because he, he had had such great results individually. I had, it's like, I looked forward to when the right context arose that our whole relationship could get the self-awareness expansion kind of shine and gratification and clarity that I had personally received from therapy. So I never had this whole like stigma about it or that it meant there was a problem. However, I remember my husband mentioned to his brother, who's uh, two and a half years younger, and he mentioned that we were working with a therapist and this wonderful man, he's actually a chief of a department at an Ivy League school. Like he, he's not intellectually a slouch at all. And he said to my husband, really? Like, I thought you would have figured that out. Like you've been married for three years. What, like, why do you need to talk to someone? So I just want to say again, that if you don't identify as having a quote, troubled marriage, that it actually is easier to lean in for help in the sexual realm. I'm not saying it's easy, it's easier, but in, invariably behind that, which is why I asked the question, are you, are you asking like how they describe it? Or what I see that typically behind that, there's a real yearning for emotional closeness and connection, which often is the red carpet to better sex anyway, in the context of a long-term relationship, not a one night stand where you can have a great time without even knowing your partner's name. That is not true when you have a life together. So it's, I guess what I want to say is that for certain kinds of things, like if someone has financial difficulty or is overweight or obese, it doesn't mean that people are super proactive necessarily, but there, it's clear there's a problem in those situations and how and whether one's going to take action, that's of course variable, but it's clear that there's something that needs attention. They're not going to deny that. But when it comes to a really good solid marriage and you just put more attention into work and you get more involved with the kids and you redo the kitchen. Like there's so you plan incredible vacations, you pick up tennis, like there's so many societally approved and individually approved ways to channel our attention that eases the discomfort of sharing a life with someone when you don't genuinely feel seen and cherish to the levels you desire, even though you know you're appreciated and the relationship is overall pretty collaborative. Right. And you're hosting the parties and in at, on the surface, surface, everything seems just fine. But behind closed doors, what I'm hearing is that you see ambitious women who are accustomed to being able to figure it out. You know, I got the degree, I built the business, I've done the thing. This should be figure outable. And, um, and really, um, there is a vulnerability that is touchy. And so couples come to you and they, they'll use the doorway of improving their sex life. But really what they're looking for is to actually feel more heard and seen and to feel emotionally close and truly vulnerable in the midst of their marriage, rather than just kind of business partners passing in the night. Absolutely. And I really respectfully want to honor, because I know you recently did a wonderful episode on vulnerability for women with other women. And in this context, at least, part of the vulnerability is that the kind of woman you've described, which is absolutely the kind of woman that I support as a coach, it's a big deal to not know, to feel uncertain, to not even be sure. That's actually one of the dominant things is to not even be sure there is a solution. So 
she's she's oriented to ROIs in her life, whether she's a math person or a creative person, she's oriented to the return on the investment of her time, attention, efforts, money. And often it takes our first conversation for her to really believe that something can change. I'm always humbled that when I ask, as I do after most conversations, but certainly the initial conversation I have with a couple, you know, what are your takeaways? And literally 100% of the time, one or both of them say hope. And it really touches my heart because I don't experience them as hopeless people. They do not walk around like feeling hopeless. These are people who know how to make things happen, but it's when they feel that hope that the absence of it is also presenced in the room often for the first time. And also I'm hearing maybe they didn't even fully acknowledge their lack of hope until you're able to gracefully and gently turn the light switch on and um, kind of like I see this beam where the path is illuminated and they go, oh, wow, I didn't even acknowledge that I had kind of let go of hope, but now I feel it and I have it and I'm grateful to be here. Yes, it's a refined observation and it's actually ultimately related to a woman giving herself permission to connect with her desire because when you're day in, day out, things are the way they are and you don't think they can change, it doesn't actually feel good to be wanting something else. That's just an exercise in frustration and that's not efficient. And so for people who are good at making things happen, compartmentalizing, that's just a distracting indulgence, except for like every now and then. And so in any work really, in any meaningful, positive um, progress that's growth oriented, you need to know where you are now and where do you want to be? What are your desires? And I don't mean like that you want him to take the trash out without your asking. I mean, how do you want to feel? Never mind who's going to do what in the relationship for this to occur. How do you want to feel? And when someone can name that without blame or resentment towards their partner, not fulfilling that already, but just like really marinate in the beauty of the desire. Well, then for someone with expertise, it's not that complicated to right away connect the dots and see the roadmap from where they are to where they want to go. But really, in my mind, the hope just naturally follows the willingness to feel the desire. Mm, so good. And do you think most, I'll say women, but most human beings um, compromise their desire, compromise even listening into what they desire, feeling their body, acknowledging what, what they desire. I definitely do. And I'll go ahead and give my framework for this because really throughout the Western world, possibly the whole world, but definitely throughout the Western world, far and away, the most common relationship advice that is given is that you need to be good at compromise. You need to learn to compromise. Having a happy marriage is all about compromise. And the fact is that is just completely false. <laughs> right? Listen to the expert, my friends. <laughs> well, Listen to it's the expert. false. We, we have both the divorce rate and an epidemic of conflict-free, passion-free relationships to show mm -hmm. for it, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the thing is that compromise is extremely useful if what you want to create is a bland, pleasant companionship. And I honor that actually that is exactly what some people want. If they're coming out of traumatic situations, like let's not knock a bland, pleasant companionship. 
However, <laughs> that's definitely not what I want or you want or most women who know how to make things happen in their lives. And so if you want a juicy, nourishing, erotically alive relationship, well, then uncompromising intimacy is the way to get there. And it's essential that I say what I mean by uncompromising. It's not that you always get your own way. It is not my way or the highway. That's not a nourishing relationship. Insofar as compromise is not honoring your desire, not saying what you want, not expressing what's really happening within you so that your partner doesn't have to be uncomfortable, that when it comes to being uncompromising, I'm talking about learning how to share really the truth of who you are, what's alive in you and what you desire, and sometimes even your concerns, but to share, learn to share them in a way that your partner is glad to hear them and that you make space for them to express themselves as well. Because yes, that gets back to your question. We, we compromise on our desire in order to keep things safe and our partner comfortable. And you do that long enough in little ways, like which shelf the milk is kept in in the refrigerator to big ways in terms of where you go on vacation, whether or not you have another child, like the whole spectrum of choices and preferences, it becomes a habit mm. to just do what seems expedient rather than what you right. desire. Don't ruffle feathers. Don't be heard. Don't be seen. Be a nice girl. Yes. And I've had the experience so many times where I say to a woman, well, what do you really want? And she knows exactly what her husband wants and exactly what her kids want and what both of them need. And like, she she's very oriented to what others need okay yes but what do you want and so maybe she says i'll just take it all the way further like she might say i just want a day to myself and then i'll say okay great so if you have a day to yourself how would you like to spend it what would be nourishing for you oh i don't know Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is permission to desire, permission to be uncompromising, permission to actually get quiet with what is alive in me. I'm really good at knowing everyone else's desires and serving others. But what about my desire? If I give myself permission to get quiet with what do I want? What do I want? What do I want to touch? What do I want to hear? What do I want to taste? What do I want to feel? What do I want to do? How do I want to be treated? How do I want to be heard? How do I want to be seen? What do I want my day to look like to, to really get into that and then figure out how to communicate it. And I imagine there's many women listening and saying, okay, well, even if, even if I allowed myself to get clear with my desire, if I tried to then communicate it to my husband or my children, I don't think that they would be able to receive it. So what then? I love the question because really that's what my work is. And I provide the answers in my book and in my programs, and I'm going to give an answer now, but I just really want to say that I am continually humbled at how when people understand and make a small adjustment, it's so rich. I, I just received an email from this man who has been in the military for 25 years, married for 20. And anyway, the point is that he just asked his wife questions with a different quality of attention and presence and they're both so much happier now. Like it, this really, this really isn't complicated. I just want to say that the problem, like at a society level, is complicated. But to actually pivot and change, so 
The answer in terms of how there are six different elements, all of which sound super simple and they are, but the application is deeper and deeper and richer and more refined. So the six ways to communicate successfully are to cultivate curiosity, embrace honesty, be kind, choose happiness, take responsibility, and seek growth. So we can talk about each of those as much or as little as you like, Mariah, but I will say, because somebody listening can implement this right away, that cultivate curiosity is, it's so important and it's so easy because if you think back to the feeling of being in love and like all that wonderful energy, that is all about being curious. Like not only, but it's part of it. It's like, where does that scar from? Where does that scar come from? And what did you, what vegetables did you like when you were a child? And if you weren't in this profession, which one would you seek? I mean, the, the questions, the like unsatiated interest is so huge. And then we get together and things become familiar and comfortable, and that is wonderful. I'm not looking to undo that, but often it comes at the cost of curiosity. And so if what we've been talking about resonates at all, one of the simplest things to do is to just start asking open-ended questions where you're genuinely interested in the answer, there's no right or wrong response, and it can be serious, it can be whimsical. If you could be president, what policies would you implement? If you could have dinner with a celebrity alive or dead, who would it be and what would you ask? It could be about sexual fantasies. It could be, what was the most gratifying part of this past week for you? In other words, it doesn't matter at what level, it just matters that you open and essentially are inviting your partner to reveal more of them, not because it's private, not because it's a secret, but because your conversations have become so familiar that less of you gets to be shared with one another. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of two things. The, um, the Einstein quote, I have no special talents. I'm only passionately curious. Mm. And um, I remember when Michael and I, you know, we've been together since 2007. And yes, to therapy from the very beginning, before we were even married, it's just one of our value systems. When we're solid and when we're strong, even now we're in a great place and we still make sure to, to continue to build our resources and support system in therapy while we're strong so that it's there the next time we're in a trough. And I remember, in 2014, we were at a really intense time. It was, it was, it was low. My, I had had a health, my health had crashed. We had two little babies at home. There was financial struggle. There was a lot going on and we looked at each other and we thought, okay, how are we going to rebuild this? What, where do we start? And so yes, therapy, but we started going on a date every week. We found a sitter and we started at the beginning. We said, let's just pretend that we've never met one another before and just like fully play the role. Hi, what's your name? Where are you from? Where'd you go to school? Do you uh -huh. have any brothers and sisters? It was so fun. And then we would do a Google search for like best first date questions and literally just play the part, sit at a bar and um, have a mocktail and be passionately curious. And it was such a fun, exciting way to revive the passion and the laughter and to fall in love with one another again. I'm curious if you have any resources, like you just gave a lot of examples of questions that we could passionately carry with curiosity, lean into someone. Do you have a resource out there if someone's going, okay, I love this idea, but where do I come up with the questions? I don't even know. We haven't done this in so long. Where would you send someone? Okay. Well, I have two different kinds of resources. 
One, I have, um, I can send you the link. I think it's alexandrastockwell.com forward slash questions. And the name of that is actually seven questions to divorce proof your marriage. But really it's because there's the curious questions we're talking about now, but also much deeper questions that people often don't actually consider until they're getting divorced or until they are divorced about like success and how to make like a definition of success and how to make financial decisions that, that really there's, there's this awakening that happens for many people when they get divorced, where they clarify for themselves what they actually want. And so this particular thing that I've shared is so that you can answer these questions for yourself and with your partner while you're married so that you can align. So that's one resource. And the other resource that I like a lot, it's called Big Talk. And it's a whole collection of questions that's available on Amazon. And it's unlikely that someone's going to want to use all of the questions. I actually have a client right now who's in the process of like rehydrating her marriage. I'm just coaching her, not the two of them together. And so she bought these and she has them in a bowl in her kitchen. And she didn't want like with, in, with some couples, you could just go through the cards together or each pick one, but that's not their dynamic. And so when, they sit down to dinner, she usually just looks at one or two cards and then just brings those questions into the dinner conversation without actually having the physical card there, but that inspires her so she doesn't need to think Fun. about it. And yeah, yeah, totally, like there's no reason to get stumped on figuring it out. Yeah. Um, I will say that I once gave a talk and it really, it was all about how to make vulnerable communications and include questions like this. And there was a woman in the audience who was at the event for something else. She actually wasn't looking to attend my talk, but she just ended up saying, staying in the room when I spoke, she'd been married for 35 years and said, you know, she had a very good marriage. She had no reason to be there. And she heard what I said and she went home and she messaged me the next day because she just asked her husband, a few questions and really listened to the answers. And she said they had no problems, but they felt more intimate than they had in about five years, just from asking a few questions and really being present. And I guess because you listener are likely to be a pretty high performing woman, woman I want to say that it's not just asking the question, it's also listening generously. And if your partner gives an answer that you don't like, just focus on the fact that they're opening up and telling you because whatever they're saying is true. Like you can listen generously. This isn't the time to say, you know, if where they want to take a vacation is um, South Africa and you really don't want to be on a long flight, let's just say, and you don't already live in South Africa or one of the neighboring countries, that you just want to say in response, you know, oh, what would you do if we were there as opposed to, oh, I don't want to go. Right. To cultivate the openness and staying in curiosity and honesty and kindness and with a spirit of happiness and res taking responsibility and being in a growth mindset. Exactly. And I think the hardest one to implement for the super achieving woman is kindness. Oh. Not because uh, totally because we're in a, we're in our masculine and we're like getting stuff done so direct laser sharp and there's an efficiency and a directness that isn't as kind as we often think it is and I'm not talking about becoming soft, like equating, I mean, maybe you are soft, maybe you want to be, but I'm not talking about equating that kind of gentleness with kindness. I think the main adjustment in being more kind is the tone of voice. Mm. And I have been astonished at what I can say that if I were reading the script, I would be like, I can never say that. Yes, actually, 
in becoming uncompromising, you can say it so long as you have kindness in your tone. A, a woman's tone is a usually a squandered superpower. Right. Well, you think about mothers. I mean, children pick up on the tone brilliantly. And of course, our partners do too. So kindness and tone. And I imagine pace and volume and all of that. What about, so you've mentioned a few times the highly successful woman, the ambitious woman, the woman that's the go-getter is accustomed to being efficient. Do you think it's common for that woman to feel less than supported in her relationship? I definitely do. I definitely do. And I also think she typically underestimates the impact of treating her spouse like an employee, like basically managing her husband. And so, yes, she doesn't feel supported. In fact, often she doesn't even realize how much support is possible. And it can very much feel like it's because he's not showing up for her. And I'm not denying the reality of that, but we, we don't make it easy when what works well in a professional context for managing people, for inspiring them, for rewarding them, when we take that same skill set and essentially manage or project manage our husbands, that is already a dynamic which is going to prevent genuinely feeling supported. And I actually, let's see, in 2019, my husband is a physician who's worked very long hours since we met. He went to three days a week. So I know you brought your husband home. That is not my situation, but he went to three days a week. And it made a lot of space for me to really go much more deeply into my business and expand. And so three days a week, he's with the children and I really am not. But it took about a year to a year and a half for me to actually allow the support because even when he was with the children all day Monday and all day Friday, I would figure out what was for lunch and what was for dinner and let him know. And I would leave a list of things that needed to happen. I mean, it, it goes on and on how, like, I knew it was wonderful, but I kind of treated him as a glorified babysitter, not in general, but just during this time. And it, he was willing there was definitely a learning curve because he hadn't been doing this for 20 years. And so he did some things that were kind of dumb, but I'd been doing it for 20 years. And his learning curve was how to figure out how to be with our children and do the dishes at the same time. However, my learning curve was to actually let go actually not suddenly come out of my office if I heard crying, how to really let myself be supported such that now he communicates with all the moms about the baseball practice and like all these things that I never would have dreamed I could trust to anyone but me. So yes, I definitely think the woman we're talking about often doesn't feel supported, but as someone who's oriented to couples, I think she's creating that situation more than she can imagine until she lets go of control, which is risky because balls will be dropped and things will not be done as well or as identically to how you did them. But that's all part of allowing the support. Does that match up with totally. your experience? Because yeah, I know, I, yeah, I, I can think of some similar, some definite similarities. And you know, the big thing that I'm hearing is we 
we get to expand our um, receivership because, you know, I think about in my scenario, when we brought my husband home, that was July of 2021. And there was definitely recalibration. The kids were recalibrating. Um, I'd go downstairs and he had moved the kitchen around, changed where things were stored. And it was like changing around the laundry system. And there was a part of me that just had to go, yes, I'm going to allow myself to receive because really it's what's, what's the big deal. If the system is changed around, he's getting it done. The food for the first year um, for me wasn't very palatable. <laughs> and um, I learned to, to, to um, do my best at being gentle with suggestions and helping come up with recipes. And now there are moments that I feel resentful that, um, you know, it feels like the pressure of the finances are on my shoulders. And he, you know, when I, when I'm, especially in my PMS week and I'm allowing myself to feel kind of like, wound up and working too much and not really allowing myself to to get clear with what i desire and communicate that when i instead observe resentfulness and irritability then i'll point the finger and ah oh, this is so not fair you get to play but the reality is we're working it out the the other thing i just did a, a free workshop last week and i was using the term the cvo or sorry sorry yeah cvo as the chief venting officer, <laughs> I, uh -huh. I think sometimes we will treat our partner or our husband as the CVO. Or if there's a man that's listening to this and he's working and holding down the Ford and he comes home, how often do we kind of treat our partner as an employee or someone that we just vent to and unload the things that have happened in the day? And I have to remind myself, He's my husband and he's my best friend and he's my sexual partner and he's my co-parenter. And he also plays CFO and he also is, you know, doing a lot of things within the business, but to be able to allow spaciousness to play different roles at different times and not treat him as a CVO feels like an important um, conversation in the midst of this. Yes, I completely agree. And I wouldn't say from the perspective of being uncompromising that therefore you don't ever vent. I just want to say that, yes, there are times when we can pivot as long as it's a genuine pivot and not a suppression or a compartmentalization. And then it leaks out as resentment or grumpiness later. Like if we can genuinely pivot, then go for it. But the other option is to be really clear, really direct. And so my husband and I, it actually doesn't, it used to happen a lot more. It doesn't happen because we do pivot, but it does happen where I will say to him, I really want to vent. Are you available for that? And let me just say, that is a genuine question. He might say, you know what? It's just been too much. No, he doesn't say it that way. But anyway, the point is he, he ca that, that is a question where no is a perfectly fine answer. But if the answer is yes, and it used to be actually totally overwhelming for my husband, because when I would vent, he would, he wouldn't know how much longer I was going to go on. And he it was wants like to fix this, it. it. This meandering thing. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> when we first started doing this, I would say how long I needed. And it showed me that I had no idea. I would say, oh, just 10 minutes. And then, you know, 30 minutes later, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting going. So what I learned to do is say how long he says, yes. And if I want more, I say, actually, can I have another 20 minutes? And anyway, and sometimes there it's like oh sure or actually i really need to transition and take care of this but the point is that i ask rather than just dumping on him and that already makes a very different interaction the other thing which it sort of can get our feminist hackles up but i genuinely mean it is when you're venting your partner does not need to carefully listen to everything you're saying. Like if you're making a vulnerable communication, then yes, you want them fully present. But the empowered stance here 
is when you want to vent, say, I only need 40% of your attention. I only, I mean, you can start, just go to 90% if that is like risky enough. But, but when we are venting, we do not need our partner to pick up everything that we're letting go of. Like there is a gift in telling particularly a man you know, I only need about 30% of your attention. And that makes that venting a much cleaner experience and allows it to be the transition that has everybody feeling more nourished and vitalized. And you're not sort of withholding or, or having the grumpiness come out indirectly or whatever the case may be, because there is a time when venting is actually the best way forward right yes with and consent asking for, and asking permission first even right now we're trying on even when it comes to appreciation hey i have some appreciation to share are you open to receiving it just that moment of pause mm. yeah i'm open to receiving it okay we have talked about so much from i mean obviously the initial intention was to talk about compromise and why not to compromise we talked about feeling alone we talked about desires for emotional closeness permission and and getting clear with our desires uh ways to communicate and questions to ask to feel deeply connected once again um interactions with with our partners especially for the ambitious woman who's accustomed to being efficient and how to vent and when to vent and how to ask permission um any last thoughts that you have for the individuals that are listening um anything that feels unsaid obviously we'll get that link from you with the set with the six questions all of your social media links and your website and all the ways for everyone to reach out to you will be in the show notes Anything else that you'd like to add? Yes. I feel like actually our whole conversation was a playground to convey this this thing I'm about to say, which is that if you feel stuck, there actually are so many more options that it's not like you shouldn't expect to be able to figure it out. Like we have blind spots. This is where community comes in, whether, whether it's a coach or a program or whatever it is that just talking things through so many things open up and there really genuinely are ways to enjoy uncompromising intimacy no matter how stuck on any particular issue you feel yeah i love it particularly the community and the group piece because i i find and i'm guessing you do too um people that a lot of women end up feeling very alone and they go through it alone not realizing that it's more common than we think And so how spectacular to be able to receive solutions and to feel so much more deep in your relationship and and your relationship with yourself as well as others, but also to realize, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. You know, we already feel maybe alone in our home. We feel alone in our relationships. For the entrepreneurs, there's a lot of loneliness that happens with entrepreneurship because we're crazy enough to take a route that the feedback is always changing. I was just hearing a study with like, they were looking at dogs. And if you give a dog enough, if you change the variable enough, they'll stop trying, which makes perfect sense. But we crazy entrepreneurs, even though the variables are always changing, we we keep trying and there's some loneliness there. And so to be able to say, all right, I'm willing to speak something that feels very vulnerable and acknowledge the fact that I do long for more deep fulfillment and connection. And then to find a space, it sounds like you hold that space as well, that can create a community where you go, oh my gosh, I'm not the only one. Yes, and it is everything you said, as well as the pure inspiration from hearing, from witnessing other people. And my experience is that when couples are in a group program, 
invariably they feel better about their relationship, either because they see how others are navigating things and it provides so much inspiration or because they feel like, well, at least we're not dealing with that. And that is a wonderful <laughs> right. feeling too. <laughs> right, right. So it sounds like you do group work and one-on-one -on -one work. Yes. So I have independent study programs for people who want to really just do this uh, learning and transformation on their own time in their own home privately. I have uh, group programs and yes, I also do private work. Okay. And the best way for someone to reach out to you? alexandrastockwell.com. That is the gateway to find my podcast, my book, social media programs. You're welcome to contact me. Just everything. The party starts at alexandrastockwell.com. Right. Yeah. So even more so than social media platforms, really just go to her website and that's the, the landing place. And we'll make sure her site is in the show notes. Um, Alexandra, I'm just so grateful for who you are and the work that you do in the world and the way in which you are elevating um, humankind, really. <laughs> that sounds kind of grandiose, but it is, and it's true. So thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be in service and commune with you about mm -hmm. doing so. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everyone, reach out to Dr. Alexandra Stockwell if you feel like your heartstrings have been pulled today. And with that, thank you for listening into the Women's Vibrancy Code podcast. Go pop into Intimate Marriage Pod, the Intimate Marriage Podcast. The Intimate Marriage Podcast. And let's link to the interview with you and Michael. Yeah, we'll add in the link to talk about vulnerability. <laughs> It's it was a fun it was a fun conversation and I'll have the um, podcast team make sure to put that link in there too. All right, good stuff. Y'all are awesome. Thank you for your time, Dr. Stockwell.